Um, welcome, sorry for the D-Day, but now we actually can start. If people can stop talking, whatever. Okay, so um, there's two of us here today. Uh, me, I'm Richard, I'm a part of Prometheus team. Uh, I'm wearing a few other hats. This is Ben. Hi. Uh, and I'm going to hand over for Ben for the first half. Uh, oh, just for the structure of this talk, we decided to keep some concerns and, uh, and best practices about operations and observability in here, even though it is Prometheus specific, because chances are if you're new to Prometheus, you hugely benefit from the observability stuff as well. All right, so uh, who here has heard of Prometheus? Yay. Uh, who's uh, not using it yet, but is thinking about it? All right, uh, who's uh, already using it as like, as like a concept? Testing, yeah. And then how many people are uh, like full on, uh, it's all in production? Awesome. <laughs> a few people, yeah, nice. Um, I can uh, okay. Uh, so uh, where did Prometheus come from? So uh, back in uh, late 2012, early 2013, uh, we were, uh, SoundCloud was working on their own container environment. So they, they were already doing a containerized environment. And uh, they had a couple of ex-Google engineers that uh, knew that c container monitoring was going to be a different story than uh, a normal setup. And they, they had Graphite, and it was okay, and they had Nagios, and it was okay, but they really wanted to, uh, to converge those tools. And, you know, being former Google engineers, they had used Borgmon, which is Google's, uh, uh, one of Google's internal monitoring systems. Uh, and it was really well uh, put together to do container monitoring. Um, and uh, and it's a little different in it from something like Nagios for monitoring. Is it started with this time series database, uh, and it uses that uses the time series database as its core. Um, Prometheus is very simple. Uh, it uses uh, only metrics uh, that are numeric. Uh, it started with the instrumentation. So actually, the first thing that uh, was developed when they were developing Prometheus was uh, an instrumentation library so that they could start collecting the, or they could start producing the data in order for, for it to be used for monitoring. Um, uh, it's not an event logging system. Uh, it's not a replacement for Elasticsearch or Splunk or those kind of things. Uh, we consider that a separate, uh, a separate system. Is, and so Prometheus is like a very specialized single tool uh, uh, to make it really like powerful uh, without needing uh, to handle every use case. Um, and... Uh, you need to hurry a little. Okay. So the main selling point is it's, it's very simple. It has very dynamic uh, built-in service discovery. Uh, it has a very powerful pro uh, query language for extracting data from the metrics. It's super simple to operate. It's super efficient. Um, you can monitor many, many, many uh, thousands of, uh, of processes with, with one Prometheus server. Um, it's pull-based. Uh, it uses, uh, uh, it, it knows your network topology and collects the data. Um, you can do black box monitoring by uh, configuring uh, a black box exporter. Uh, it can do white box monitoring, so it can, it can go directly into your application and pull data out so that you, uh, you can expose things that are are more granular than you could get out of your event logs. So um, one of the things that I talk about uh, when developing is if you have things that you might want to have from debugging, uh, you can have metrics for those without having to actually have the cost of debug level logs. Um, uh, it has uh, uh, some stability guarantees. Uh, we're, we don't have a, a very good security model yet, but that's a work in progress. Um, so one of the things that we talk about is time series. So what is a time series? Because uh, this is kind of fundamental to how Prometheus works. It's uh, a regularly collected data point uh, with a timestamp over a long period of time, uh, which could be hours or days or months or years. Um, and uh, in Prometheus, we like to collect really raw data. So uh, if you have an event in your system you get a re request to an API, uh, your API generates an error, you make a database request, whatever, you count those 
uh, and just uh, we store the raw counts in Prometheus. Um, but some things uh, aren't really countable. How many things are in a queue or the temperature of a sensor? Uh, those things are, are what we call gauges, is they, they go up and down and you can only, you, you have to sample them uh, instead of w with a counter, you sample, when you sample a counter, you know it was uh, one at time A and 10 at time B. Um, uh, Prometheus is super efficient. Uh, we uh, just did some, had some new benchmarking recently uh, where the important key metric for us was actually not how fast we could ingest because uh, it turns out that a million samples per second is more than plenty for just about every situation we've run across. Uh, what we really wanted is we, we wanted to get the, the cost to ingest down. So uh, we got it to, it's now about 200,000 samples per second per CPU. So if you uh, don't want to waste resources on your monitoring, uh, Prometheus is a, su is a super, uh, um, uh, super efficient there. Actually, this is a typo. It's actually uh, not 1.3 oh. bits per sample. It's actually uh, 1.3 bytes per sample. Uh, and that's, of course, data dependent. Uh, so the Prometheus compression can actually do a little better. So for example, uh, if you just have uh, a piece of data that doesn't change, that compresses down to 0.17 bytes per sample. Uh, it, so it's it's really really cheap to ingest lots and lots of data, and if it's not changing, it's not it's even less of a big deal. Um, uh, how do you get data into Prometheus? Well, uh, we have a very simple uh, text representation, and basically uh, the metric name represents some line of code. Uh, so HTTP request total represents the request handler in your application. Uh, and then you can tag it. So some labels come from the code, like th uh, the status code or the method, and some labels come from your discovery, like the environment. Uh, so one of the key things about uh, Prometheus is we have two, two basic kinds of labels. We have labels that come from the target, we have labels that come from discovery. So that you can, uh, the application developer doesn't have to know about the environment that the code is running in, because you could take a piece of code from Kubernetes uh, or other, some other random piece of software, and if your company has uh, different hierarchical concepts, uh, they'll, uh, you can apply those labels differently than another company would. Uh, so one of the interesting things about Prometheus is we went with a, a vector style programming language or a, a query language uh, versus SQL because it makes some things much, much simpler. So uh, when you do uh, a very simple query like average, uh, average temperature by city, uh, that's pretty simple. It's also pretty easy to do in, in SQL. But if you want to take an, uh, two different metrics and do math between them, uh, in SQL that gets super complicated super fast. Uh, and there's even worse examples than this where uh, a single line of PromQL would be hundreds of lines of SQL. Uh, for visualization, uh, we started out with our own uh, dashboard system, but most of us uh, working on Prometheus, are, uh, we're all back-end developers. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of UI people, so we said, eh, we'll just delete that code and let Grafana be our, our front end. So most people who are using Prometheus are using Grafana. Uh, it's beautiful, it's nice, I like it a lot. Um, and then uh, now I'm gonna hand off to Richard to talk about the second, uh, second half. Yeah, so the second half, before we hopefully have a lot of time for questions, um, we just want to look at some basic concepts of both good operations and good observability. One of the single most things to realize and actually have at the front of your head while, while designing systems and working on systems is the concept of toil. Um, which is basically manual work which you repeat endlessly and which doesn't generate lasting benefit. Also, it scales roughly linearly with your workload or the amount of users or whatever. Why is this a, such an important concept? Basically, while you're always putting out fires, of course there's an outage here or you need to provision a new service there, blah, 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 blah. You don't have time to actually sit down and think about the whole system to actually engineer a good system. Basically, by getting rid of that kind of work, which does not provide any lasting value, you have time to focus on stuff which actually benefits you and your company or your team or whatever. Obviously, while, while trying to change your system, it means 
you even have to have more work or you keep your old stuff working and whatever your scripts, your new monitoring and such, which helps you reduce your toil will come on top on top. So it's really important when you try to, to, to do anything, any change at your company, but especially when you want to reduce work, you kind of have to explain that you increase work for a short time until you reduce the total amount of work. So having immediate benefits, which you can, where you can show, okay, people look here, this is good stuff, that what's, uh, that's what gets you buy-in. Then uh, we have the concept of sleep. Most humans like to sleep. Um, and how do, you, how do you get your system into a state where you actually have time for family, for time off, for whatever, instead of being woken by the pager or by any emergency all the time? Basically, it depends a little bit or a lot on, on agreeing within your company how you want to run things. And if something is not actionable, like you don't know what to do with an alert, then it cannot be an alert by definition. It should not be woken, it should not be escalated unless you know what to do and how to fix and how to approach it. If it's not urgent, it should also not be an alert. It should be persistent in your ticket system or whatever, and you can do it during business hours next business day. There is no need to be woken at three in the morning for something which could easily be handled next morning. Also, if you have good usage prediction or even auto-scaling, that also means you don't get woken by random stuff just going 1% over whatever your baseline is. And again, try to do this during business hours. Then something really important, if there is no, by the people who build it, playbook, documentation, how to run a thing, it should never ever go into production. Of course, basically, if you do it any, any other way, what happens is the on-call engineers are the ones who then get to document the system they didn't build which is not a good thing to have. And also if there is no clear concept which is agreed upon by management, what the actual targets of availability and of latency and of all these things is for that product, it should also not go into production. Of course, if you don't know what you're actually running, you shouldn't be running it or you should think more about how to run it. Also really important while, while having these, these discussions in your company, Every single role will think a lot differently about what you actually do. And some people care deeply about certain aspects of what you do and none at all about others. And this is really important to keep in mind. The managers, they will think about revenue and that's about it. And about process ex execution, but they don't actually do the processes. So that's the architects. They care about good process definition and about a good clean design which hopefully also gets implemented. Then others would like to have just the high level overview of yes, things are fine. Team leads obviously want their team to be motivated and to, to have energy while working and not be totally demotivated. And the actual operators, oh, this is us being weird. Oh, oh, okay, okay it's fine. Um, and the actual operators, they probably want to have some sleep and family time, so um, you should try and optimize for that as well. And tell everyone, basically you have this big picture and everyone wants the same thing, but they care about different aspects of this. So when talking about how to implement something new, hopefully Prometheus, at your company, you should, um, you should really try to, uh, to tell people what they want to hear and what they need to hear, instead of just uh, telling everyone the same story. But also, also, obviously, never ever lie, of course, uh, that'll come back to you and it'll not be pretty. So, post-mortems are also hugely important. Of course, mistakes will happen. No system is perfect. Something will break, so you have to design the system in a way that breaking is fine. You have to learn from those mistakes. Of course, if you just keep making the same mistakes, you will lose a ton of users. And also, this is like the textbook definition of toil. But there's a very important aspect. If people fear retribution when they make a mistake, they will not be honest about what mistakes they made. So unless you have a culture at your company, in your team, in your whatever, where, you, where it's actually okay to say, okay, I made a mistake and this is how this mistake folds into the whole big picture and everyone else is also honest about their mistakes, about their actions, when they did what and what they didn't do and such. 
then you can actually write those blame-free postmortems, where you write explicitly someone that acts, you don't have to name them, but you write engineer of database team drop database, that was not a good idea and everything was gone. You write this down, of course then people can read it later and they can learn from that and you can build institutional knowledge in your company based on those past mistakes and not repeat those mistakes. But it's really, really important to build this trust. Of course, if someone assumes that if they document that they did something wrong, that they'll, be, pick, uh, they'll be, be kicked out of the company or something, they will never, ever document this properly. So this trust internally is hugely important. Then leveraging this one system, uh, system again, hopefully Prometheus. If you have one combined system as opposed to a ton of different systems, you can actually correlate that data. You can take different aspects of your whole state of the system and you can, you can actually make deductions. If you have both your services and your data center in the same monitoring system, you can actually graph the power usage against how many users you have on that system. Myself, I started in networking and we had weird issues with a line where the out, a, a quick change in outside temperature, up or down, took down a certain uh, long haul line, a certain dark fiber, which took ages to find out. Um, we didn't have Prometheus, but even that, such things, you could in theory just correlate and just put into context if you have the data in the same, in the same uh, system. And there is tons and tons and tons of other things. And as you now have this good way to do math, to do actual math on your metrics, you have the ideal starting point to jump into your logs, into your traces, into whatever course metrics are usually the start of something. Of course, they are easy to aggregate and easy to work with. So you can go from there and you can jump into other parts of your whole observability system to get the full picture. Sometimes metrics are already enough, but sometimes you just need to look somewhere else and this is almost always the best starting point. And when you have this one source of truth, which might be one system or several systems, then you have everyone agree on that state. You have the same tactical overview for your current state. You have the same data in your drill down. You have the same data in the PDFs which you send to customers when they want to have an outage report or just a monthly or whatever report. You have the same stuff which sales can use to base their SLOs and SLAs on. You have the same stuff for accounting, blah, 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 blah. So by having this one source of data, you actually agree on what the state of your system is across all the different teams in your company, which also is not very often the case and should be. So yeah, a little bit placative. I don't know if this actually translates to Chinese, this uh, if all you have is a hammer uh, saying, but no, it probably doesn't. Okay. So, we have some time for questions. Shoot. Oh, hold on. Is there any correlation capability in Prometheus right now? Between what, sorry? Correlation, even oh, correlation mean? and uh, matrix correlation. Um, there's no automatic correlation for a simple reason. In a big system, you will always find something which correlates with something. Um, so you have to have, at least as of right now, to ha you have to have humans look at the data and make deductions. Automated, automated uh, correlations, the systems aren't far enough. Yeah, there, there are some uh, uh, companies out there working on external correlation systems that pull the data from Prometheus. So the idea that we had with Prometheus is it's the data collector and it's the first level of monitoring and uh, we wanted to keep it simple and robust and not require tons and tons of CPU time uh, uh, so that a single Prometheus server is very, very, a very, very small piece Quick of the overall answers. system. So uh, people are building external correlators that will use the Prometheus data uh, and then spend the extra CPU time outside of the, uh, the thing that keeps your, your alerts going. I think there was a question here also. Okay, I think uh, Prometheus is great. But uh, uh, one problem to put that into production is that uh, we need to build a high available, high available cluster and uh, it should be scalable. So, so is there any effort to uh, uh, make Prometheus 
uh, high available and scalable? There's actually several. So for just normal Prometheus, you can just run two as a pair and they can do, basically they both do exactly the same. So if one fails, uh, you have the same, but you also have a remote read write API where you send data to, to other ingesters. There's two which are basically modifi modified Prometheus, which are Tennis and Cortex. And there's tons of others. We have a total of 12 different ones listed in the meantime. And those can actually do HA and persistent and such. So currently you should probably be looking at Cortex if you need more availability than, than standard Prometheus can give you. But again, this is basically modified Prometheus. So it comes from Prometheus team members. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, or I think we're going to be talking more about that at yes. the deep dive tomorrow. So we'll, we'll be talking about high availability and, and that kind of stuff tomorrow. More questions? I think you had a second question. Uh, scalability and data retention, you just okay. answer me. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, just data retention, you can do it with one single instance or you should be using two. But uh, what we've been doing at work for since late 2015, we kept the same data within the same systems and it just worked. Uh, we got into scaling issues towards the end, but 2.0 really uh, changed all that. Um, so just long-term retention, if you take good care of your machines, already works uh, within Prometheus. And also, I mean, if you do the pairing, you basically have HA. It kind of depends on what you want to have your, your availability for. If you want to have it for alerts, HA, like just having a pair is already way enough. If you want to have uh, graphs which are continuous, if you need to show them to customers and such, currently I would be using Cortex. So how about the uh, yeah, you, you mentioned Cortex. So how about Sonus compared to Cortex? What is the comparison how, between Sonus? Uh, okay, uh, Tom Wilkie, one of Prometheus team, uh, started Cortex. As, basically a hosted as a service Prometheus, which is scalable and, and runs directly in the cloud. So with Grafana, he's currently working at Grafana. They actually do like hosted, uh, hosted Cortex as a service. Yep. And you, so you were asking about Thanos. Yes. Uh, oh, Thanos. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, sorry. yeah so, so I, I actually, uh, my company is actually working on, uh, or the, doing the Thanos deployment uh, because I, I really like the way it uses an existing bucket storage. So we're, we're just using the Google Compute Engine storage. I think you have to start earlier. Yeah. So, so, so Thanos is a different way of doing uh, Prometheus ex, uh, scaling, where basically instead of having a separate database cluster, it takes the data and puts it into a cloud storage. So if you have... Uh, uh, any kind of cloud storage like S3 or uh, Google Compute or even Ceph, uh, you can uh, you can just uh, Thanos will take your data and put it into the external storage. And as they basically work on two different layers, um, long term I expect both Thanos and Cortex to to merge back together. So you basically have these distributed ingesters and emitters and you have object storage based uh, storage down below. So you basically have two layers of redundancy. They, I, I think they're already working on that. Cortanos, yes. Cortanos. Yes. But there is no actually, it's just planning, yeah. I don't know how much more time we have, but we'll just, uh, the, until they the keep The memory usage of, of Prometheus is, uh, in, is increasing. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> And I was wondering if I could how to uh, reduce the memory usage of Prometheus Server. Mm. Um, okay, so the question was how to reduce uh, memory usage of Prometheus. Prometheus is designed to use as much memory as it gets, um, but it doesn't need that memory. So what it does is it just keeps everything in RAM to be quicker when it answers to you. But you, uh, you have a command line flag where you can tell it the target uh, value of how much RAM it should no, use. No, that's gone. It's gone. That's yeah, so it's so changed, but it's not gone. No, it's gone. There's there's no memory. So Prometheus use the Prometheus no. 2.0 uses uh, as much memory as is needed for uh, storing the ingestion 
and handling queries. So uh, we're, we're currently working on improving our internal metrics so that you can tell is my memory being used by ingestion or is my memory being used by queries. So one of the things that we've, uh, I discovered was I had a bunch of Grafana queries that were written uh, and those Grafana queries used a lot of memory. Uh, so we uh, went through and, and created recording rules to optimize, the, uh, to reduce the amount of memory for display. Uh, and that, that significantly reduced the amount of memory. So you can use recording rules uh, to pre-aggregate data for display. Um, and then the other thing is you might just have to, it might be, uh, you have to shard. So if you have one, you know, one single Prometheus server may not be enough once you get a certain amount of ingestion because uh, you need a, a significant amount of memory to buffer all of that ingestion. Uh, and it's, it's just kind of, it's one of those things where Prometheus does need quite a lot of, of memory uh, but not a lot of CPU. Uh, we are working on a bunch of optimizations. So we're, we've been going through over the last few releases uh, and optimizing our code to reduce uh, the overall memory usage uh, for things like compactions. So look, uh, in the next few releases, the memory usage should start to come down. I'm still pretty certain you can influence the caching memory. Nope. I'll look it up, but whatever. Any other questions? Ah, one more. I have a question because currently uh, we collect uh, metrics uh, through Prometheus to compute the health index of the uh, Kubernetes clusters. So uh, now we run Prometheus inside a cluster. I want to ask if it's a, a good, good practice or not, or we should move Prometheus out of the cluster. Uh yeah, no, it's, it's actually totally fine and, and normal to run uh, Prometheus inside a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's totally fine to run it outside the Kubernetes. It, it really doesn't matter. It, it mostly, it's, uh, it depends on how much durability you want and how durable your storage is inside Kubernetes. If you've got a good, uh, if you've got a good durable storage layer for your Kubernetes cluster, then it's totally fine to run Prometheus inside the cluster. Um, uh, and actually one of the things like, the way we deploy it, uh, or the way we recommend deploying it, is actually deploying a, a, a one Prometheus per Kubernetes namespace. So if you've got multiple applications, you can deploy a Prometheus per application, uh, and we can we can maybe talk about that more in the deep dive. But there's one important consideration if you want to use Prometheus for monitoring the availability of that cluster. You have to have something sitting outside of that cluster looking into it. So depending on how important this is to you, at least what we do, um, we have physical machines which are dedicated to be used as Prometheus instances, and those monitor other Prometheus servers to make sure that we know if a certain server goes down, of course, if that server goes down, of course, the cluster is going away, you won't have any alerting on that cluster anymore. And you won't even know that that cluster is gone. So you want to have something which looks into that from the outside. If you have like 10 clusters, you can do cross checks between those. Still, there should probably be something sitting outside or above checking all these below. Yeah, similarly, we have, uh, we, uh, we have several different environments in our network, and we have one overall ops environment that cross monitors all of the other environments. Anyone else? So, whilst I recognize it's not the um, primary use case, what is there a preferred um, long-term metric storage engine at the moment? Or is yes. it sort of a... <laughs> this is a religious question. <laughs> Quite so. Um, so the common path currently would be to take good care of your Prometheus servers. Uh, ever since 2.0 we can do snapshots, so take good backups of that server and then to use either or Cortex or Thanos. Um, there's people putting stuff into other databases as well, and they're also happy, but if you're asking someone from Prometheus team, it, the answer would probably be either Cortex or Thanos. Yeah. Also depending a little bit on, on what you actually need and what your, what your prime targets are. If you just want 
scalability, blah, 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 blah. Cortex is probably better if you want to be really certain that the data is not going away. I would be currently more looking at Thanos. It kind of depends. No worries. Have time for maybe two more. Okay, then thank you very much.